So what I thought I'd do today is take you through a case study in terms of what we're doing to deliver um, some of those outcomes. Uh, we started with this mantra of start with the end in mind because a lot of the work that we've undertaken at RLB, particularly on the case study I'll take you through, was always about having that, that in mind in everything that we did, um, making sure that the objectives were being achieved. I've got about 20 minutes today to take you through the case study, um, and, um, which is about King's College uh, Champion Hill uh, Redevelopment Student Residence Scheme. I'm going to take you through how we joined the dots in terms of the soft landing strategy and the BIM strategy and brought that together and share some of the lessons learned. If you are thinking of doing a project that's similar, maybe we can share some of the, the good things that we did and some of the things that perhaps we wouldn't do again. Starting with the end in mind or starting with the objective, I kind of ask this question really, which is why do clients think that they want this, this kind of output or why do contractors or the building industry think we want this as an output? And yet if we look at the way that JCT is, um, is kind of written and practical completion, actually it suggests we should be delivering unfinished buildings. And I kind of think we need to change what we're thinking about how we deliver operational facilities because that's what our clients really want, not practically complete buildings. Just in terms of the case study, this is a, a, an image of, of Champion Hill in the, in the background. Um, why is it a case study? We've got BIM Level 2 compliance on that. For those who don't know, that means we've got um, separate architectural, engineering, building models and suppliers models. So we've integrated it into one single model. So we've got compliance um, already in terms of Level 2. We've got soft landing strategy in terms of both the SIPSI strategy and the GSL strategy. It's an EPC A-rated building, so the best energy performance building that we could achieve. And also it's BRIAM outstanding, so again, the highest level of sustainability we could achieve. In terms of the background, the scheme is in uh, Champion Hill in South, sorry, in Denmark Hill in South London. Um, it was an existing student residence scheme. There were about 460 units on the site. Um, we demolished that to build the, the new facility. We're about 12 weeks away from completion, so we are a case study that's work in progress, but um, hopefully I can demonstrate some of the things that we have done. Incidentally, 98% of all the waste from site in terms of the demolitions and site waste was uh, recycled on the scheme. We were actually brought on to do a due diligence report um, on the scheme. King's College had just bought the scheme from UPP, um, to develop it out themselves, and we undertook a gap analysis on the scheme. In doing that, we worked out actually there was um, no client brief available on, on the scheme. So none of the requirements from, from King's College were actually built into the, into the scheme at all. No one had asked them what room types that they wanted, how they wanted to run the building. So the first thing we did was spend three months working with the FM team, the ops team, and students, importantly, to work out what was the building that they wanted and worked with the design team to make sure that both the things fitted in terms of the brief and, and the design. That was in about late 2011, early 2012, and on the horizon was, um, was BIM. The government construction strategy had just been published, and um, there was a lot of chatter in the industry, as I'm sure you're all aware. But actually, it was all between design teams and constructors or contractors. And the question we kept on coming up to was, why, what did it mean for clients if that was the design and build world? How could we use that data that was available in order to make it meaningful to clients? I went to see a scheme in Leeds at the time, and um, a contractor was using BIM to kind of do not just the design and build aspects, but also the 4D modelling in terms of um, logistics around site. And when I asked the question, what are you going to do with all of that data at the end, um, they hadn't come up with a strategy for that, but they said probably print it out and hand it over to the client as O&M manuals. And I kind of thought that was a real waste and actually a real opportunity at the same time. Why BIM perhaps was practical on King's College is it's principally a new build, very simple repetitive units. We have two student room types of which are handed. Um, we've got off-site construction, bathroom pods, etc. So it felt like a really simple building. If we were going to BIM anything, it would be this project. Um, and I think the other really important thing is that King's College wanted to be an early adopter. Too, many, too often, I think, they had received projects where O&M manuals were late if they arrived at all. They had very little um, as-built information that they could kind of put their hands on. And they saw BIM as a way of enabling them to actually make sure they had as-built data available as projects were being completed. 
starting with the end in mind again, the outcome for King's actually was about attracting the best students in the world to, to study at a King's, at King's College. And this, the student accommodation offer was very much part of that, make, making sure that they are attracted to that college as opposed to any other. King's are a top 20 university in the world and they want to make sure they get the best students to study there. Our output in terms of our brief was principally this one line. All they wanted us to deliver was an operational building. Quite what that meant at the time, and the difference between that picture from practical completion, completed building to an operational building was, was a big jump, but that was the brief that uh, we received. So if BIM was on the horizon, what options did we have? We could, we could wait to the end if the O&M manuals ever turned up and try to digitise that information. We could go back to the start and maybe um, come up with the BIM execution plan, employees' information requirements. And I think at that time, people were pretty much saying, you have to start at the beginning if you're going to do BIM, otherwise it doesn't really work. Actually, we were already at stage D. We'd gone through two design reviews to get to stage D. It took about eight months, and it seemed daft, therefore, to go back to the beginning just to make it a BIM project. So what we did was, um, was to write some employer's information requirements and get the, um, got the contractor to deliver a BIM Level 2 compliant project rather than within the design team. We thought that was pretty innovative at the time, so um, I went to see Deborah Rowlands at Cabin Office, who's working in the BIM Task Group, um, to go through this. And at that time, she was working on the government self-landing policy. Um, so this was in the March before it was adopted in the September. And suddenly, it kind of made sense. If we could deliver self-landings, um, that's the outcome we really need to achieve, not BIM, because BIM is simply a vehicle to get there rather than an end in itself. You'll all be familiar with this diagram. So the three months that I mentioned earlier, we spent on, on these two, which is about establishing the brief and testing and modelling it through the design across those, those different um, work streams. Um, so we worked an awful lot with facility managers and the um, commissioning people on, on that. We, we also, I don't know if you saw that picture at the very beginning of me on a whiteboard, actually we spent an awful lot of time in a room with lots of people just writing out what we thought it was, was the outcome that we were trying to deliver to get that one version of the truth because maintenance people, I think, see different, different problems from an operational person and from a student. So that was quite useful. So I'll pick up these numbers on the, on the top because they, they pick up the next few slides. So the pre-handover, it kind of misses the construction piece, that one, but I'll, I'll come back to that. We didn't call pre-handover, we called a commissioning strategy. And we did that because we knew that we had to have a really detailed plan in order to deliver BIM and soft landings. And in fact, we started this one month after contract award to give us sufficient time so that everything was fully detailed um, in order that we could deliver against the plan. So we mapped every commission process that we needed to do to deliver the project and who needed to do it, when, where and why. Um, and in fact, we've digitised the entire process so we can do it all from a handheld computer now. Um, with a few exceptions, um, we, we can't do the lifts apparently because they have to be in paper, in triplicate and signed, but we can photocopy them and put them into the system. Um, so we've got the whole digitised process within that. The other thing that we have, and I think this is probably fairly unique, maybe not so much in the PFI field, but um, we have fully populated maintenance regimes for every single asset in the CAFM system. So we made it incumbent on the contractor to take all the, the, um, the information, manufacturer's information and tell us what the maintenance regimes were and populate it within the CAFM system. Where that wasn't available, we used FSG20 to give us the maintenance codes um, for that. We've also developed user guides. So the user guides have gone out to operational staff. They've gone out in draft to the student forum to make sure that they get buy-in. So everyone knows before they arrive in term in September this year what the building or select collection of buildings will need to do um, and how they all work. We've also got extensive training programmes and, and in a way I think we've probably bought too much training um, this side of September but we've got a whole month where we are taking all the FM and operational people through the site to make sure they fully understand how systems work and how the building works because I think these days buildings are either so complicated that you need a, a maths degree to work out how to run the BMS system or actually they're all passive measures where natural ventilation means, I don't know, you open a vent down there and up there and you kind of get crossroad. But as a student, if you just feel hot or just feel cold and don't need that, it's an irritant. So 
the better people are informed about how the building was designed and how it's meant to be used, I think it's really, really important. And all of that, incidentally, is condition precedent to PC. The reason why is we want to take the word practical out because we just want a completed facility. Just on joining the dots, I think data is, is everything. This is quite an early model that I produced um, for our scheme. It was a, it's about 18 months old, but I think it pretty much um, is the same. We started over here in terms of the CAFM piece to work out with our FM colleagues what it was, what data they needed to run this facility. Interestingly, there were only 82 attributes that were required for them to run that. Um, I should maybe share that with you afterwards and see what you've got. Um, that sits above the main database, which is our COBE compliant database. And in the operational phase, working backwards, um, we've spent the last year over here in the commissioning phase putting all that data into that model in terms of manufacturers, design information, etc., to make sure all of that's fully populated because that's a condition precedent of practical completion. What we've also got down here is the BMS system. I know there's been a, a few comments on this in the last couple of presentations, but we've linked the BMS information um, back to the CAFM system. So we've got TM22 um, data collection in terms of energy, water, heating, etc. And um, within certain tolerances, we're collecting that data hourly um, and daily to make sure that um, the building is, operates in the way it was designed. And where it doesn't, it um, raises a report on CAFM and raises a job order back to the, the contractor. So hopefully we can get buildings that perform in accordance with the way they were designed. And then people say, well, it's just about clash detection, isn't it? And I kind of think, well, we're doing all these other things within BIM. Um, so we've got integration with CAFM I've, CAFM I've touched on and some of the commissioning, training and handover stuff. But this one over here, the visualisation was also really, really important. So whilst we took people through the building in terms of the virtual model, to make sure they, were, they could understand what they were getting. We also built real models, um, the back, back of ducts on the back of bathrooms within student bedrooms, so that maintenance people could um, maintain the bathroom effectively without waking the student up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon um, whilst he was perhaps snoozing when he was trying to fix the loo. So trying to do real visualisations of r real mock-ups as well as just the, the visualisations. Um, part four of that plan was around initial aftercare, so we start this shortly. Um, so we've got quite a lot of on-site attendance as soon as students arrive on, 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 in September. Um, again, we've got quite a lot of operatives within that, but I think the reason is just to make sure the building settles in. It's rather like a, a new car. It needs to kind of bed down, settle in. The heating systems maybe don't always work. The thermostatic radiator valves aren't working in all the rooms, so there's a whole team of people there making sure that the building adjusts itself so that um, it works properly and takes out all those niggles. The team are also there to do um, user inductions, so everyone in terms of the student cohort are fully aware of how the building works, and we're there to help the FM team. Also to communicate with stakeholders um, more generally. And the last one I think is quite important is to observe the building in use. Is it in fact being used in the way that we thought it was in order that we can take that feedback and feed it into, into other projects? And finally, the extended aftercare. So I mentioned the TM22 piece. Um, that's quite an important part for students, I think, because within each of the kitchens of the flats within those units, uh, we capture real data in terms of their energy usage so they can see what, what they're using. And on the main reception, we have a scoreboard of all the flats so they can compare themselves with others. So that's a way of trying to encourage them to take more responsibility for the amount of energy they use. And hopefully they'll use that as a competition to try and improve their, their energy performance. We've got seasonal commissioning built in. Um, so clocks changed this week, so that kind of thing would be automatically kind of fed through. But we've got seasonal commissioning for two years. Um, occupant satisfaction surveys. Student surveys are really important to the university to make sure that um, in terms of the league table that it's, it's, it's up there. So we've got a, quite a lot of that within the first term to make sure that um, anything that is being picked up in terms of a problem we, we can deal with. And then the end of year review meetings. Just some additional benefits. We, we shouldn't assume, because you can write it down, that um, any contractor wants to or can deliver against any of that. Um, we, when we wrote the OG notices, were quite careful to make sure at the pre-call stage we ended up with six contractors that we knew could all deliver the scheme 
Um, and the, the ITT part of that was making sure that they really understood um, and could deliver against BIM and soft landings because we put some pretty challenging things within that. So we weighted something like 20% of the score towards BIM and soft landings and made a lot of the other criteria pass or fail to make sure we ended up with the right contractor. Employers' information requirements have been touched on today. It's really important that they're robust and understood. Um, and I think that goes back to the, the theme here, which is we start with the end and work backwards. You don't start with where you are and work forwards. This is an, in addition to what government soft landings is, but we got the contractor to buy into two years hard FM. And we did that as one, as an incentive to make sure he finished the building properly. And two, is that we wanted him to be around to make sure he fixed it in the two years immediately afterwards. So that we added that piece in um, at the end. So that gave us a full kind of a coordinated BIM and soft landing strategy. I have to say it wasn't rocket science. <laughs> when John F. Kennedy made this speech about putting a man on the moon, it was about doing it actually in three stages. It was about putting an aircraft into space. It was then about putting a man in space and then a man on the moon. And I think if you're thinking about a BIM or soft landings project, you should think of it in a similar way. It starts small and kind of build up whilst Champion Hill was the first project that Kings had done. I'm now working on the redevelopment of the Strand Campus, which is a Grade 1 listed building, and implementing the same uh, BIM and soft landing strategies there. But in terms of lessons learned, I think there were five principal lessons for us on this project. The first one was around making sure your objectives are really clear and always focusing on those objectives, because when times get tough, you need to say, why are we doing this? So always going back to that was really important. Two is about process and mapping that process out from the end to the beginning and making sure you've got key milestones against what you're measuring against. Three is about people and making sure that they're on board. We spent an awful lot of time working with people who were really um, enthusiastic about what we wanted to do. And there were people who were the exact opposite and absolutely did not want to do what we wanted to do. So we, people and getting them and their cultures to do what we wanted to do was really important. And we spent a, a lot of time investing in those relationships. The fourth thing is about data um, and making sure that data worked. So in that diagram I had up earlier, we did things like a simple bedroom with one door in it um, and tested that data flow going right all the way through because we did lose data because different systems don't talk to each other. Um, so testing that data and building on it I think is really important. We spent, as I say, a year building our data model ready for to export into the CAFM system. Um, and the fifth thing is about GSL champions, making sure there's someone there to champion government soft landings. About um, two weeks ago, I met with Deborah Rowland, and she asked me who should gov um, government soft landings champions be. Clearly, the documentation, as it's written, I think is that they are within client organisations. But at the moment, I think it's people like us who are championing um, government soft landings, because we're taking it, I think, to a number of clients up and down the country uh, in terms of the benefits we think that, that that delivers. And in doing that, I think you know, we, we're having the conversation about if you can deliver operational buildings, if you're getting all the O&M manuals um, and health and safety files at practical completion, that you have fully populated uh, maintenance regimes in place, if you're doing all of that using BIM and soft landings, why wouldn't you want to deliver all projects in that way? Thank you.